So today we will read uh, our new short story, The Scarlet Ebbis, and it's on page 426 in your textbook. A symbol is a person, animal, place, object, or activity that stands for something beyond itself. A dove, for instance, often serves as a symbol for peace. Writers often use symbols to emphasize important ideas in a story, which can act as clues to the theme. In the Scarlet Ibis, for example, a swamp comes to symbolize the love between two brothers. To identify other symbols in the story, use these strategies as you read. Look for ideas that the writer emphasizes. Note striking images and character descriptions and ask yourself what associations each one brings to mind. When you make an inference, you make a logical guess based on observations or information in the text and on your own knowledge and experience. Sometimes called reading between the lines, making inferences is an essential step in understanding the characters and ultimately the story itself. As you read, use a chart like the one shown to record inferences about the relationship between the narrator and his brother. For example, you can use a quotation. Doodle was a nice, crazy, like someone you meet in your dreams. Inferences about the relationship. The narrator basically liked his brother, but thought he was odd. Okay, let's read the background about the author. The author of The Scarlet Ibis is James Hurst. He was born in 1922. James Hurst lives near the North Carolina coast, not far from the farm where he was born. After attending college and serving in the United States Army during World War II, he studied singing at New York's famous Juilliard School. Hoping for an operatic career, he also studied in Rome, Italy, but soon gave up on this goal. Then in 1951, he settled into a long career at a large New York bank. During his early years at the bank, Hearst published short stories and a play. The Scarlet Ibis received national attention after appearing in the Atlantic Monthly in July 1960 and winning the Atlantic First Award that same year. When asked about the meaning of the story, Hearst once replied, I hesitate to respond, since authors often do not understand what they write. That is why we have critics. I venture to say, however, that it comments on the tenacity and the splendor of the human spirit. The Scarlet Ibis takes its title from a tropical bird rarely found in coastal North Carolina where the story takes place. The lush natural environment of this setting is prominent in the story. In addition to the Ibis, Hirsch uses the local names of plants for the power of their symbolic associations. For example, the exotic Ibis lands in a bleeding tree this is a type of pine tree that oozes a white sap when cut. Graveyard flowers or fragrant white gardenias often planted in cemeteries because they bloom year after year. So before we begin the story, I want you to pay close attention to symbols throughout the story. There is lots of imagery throughout the story and pay close attention to the characters. You have a student packet in SMS that includes the vocab words and all of the literary devices. You will see everything as you fill it out and complete it. All right, page 428, The Scarlet Ibis by James Turst. It was in the clove of seasons. Summer was dead, but autumn had not yet been born that the ibis lit in the bleeding tree. The flower garden was stained with rotting brown magnolia petals 
and ironweeds grew rank amid the purple flocks. The five o'clocks by the chimney still marked time, but the oriole nest in the elm was untintinated and rocked back and forth like an empty cradle. The graveyard flowers were blooming and their smell drifted across the cotton field and through every room of our house, speaking softly the names of our dead. It's strange that all this is still so clear to me now that that summer has long since fled and time has had its way. A grindstone stands where the bleeding tree stood, just outside the kitchen door. And now if an oriole sings in the elm, its song seems to die up in the leaves, a silvery dust. The flower garden is prim, the house a gleaming white, and the pale fence across the yard stands straight and spruce. But sometimes, like right now, as I sit in the cool green draped parlor, the grindstone begins to turn, and time with all its changes is ground away, and I remember Doodle. Doodle was just about the craziest brother a boy ever had. Of course, he wasn't as crazy like old Miss Leedy, who was in love with President Wilson and wrote him a letter every day, but was a nice crazy, like someone you meet in your dreams. He was born when I was six and was, from the outset, a disappointment. He seemed all head, with a tiny body, which was red and shriveled like an old man's. Everybody thought he was going to die. Everybody except Aunt Nicey, who had delivered him. She said he would live because he was born in a call, and calls were made from Jesus' nightgown. Daddy had Mr. Heath, the carpenter, build a little mahogany coffin for him. But he didn't die, and when he was three months old, Mom and Daddy decided they might as well name him. They named him William Armstrong, which was like tying a big tail on a small kite. Such a name sounds only good on a tombstone. I thought myself pretty smart at many things, like holding my breath, running, jumping, or climbing the vines in old woman's swamp. And I wanted more than anything else, someone to race to Horsehead Landing, someone to box with, someone to perch with in the top fork of the great pine behind the barn, where across the fields and swamps you could see the sea. I wanted a brother, but Mama crying told me that even if William Armstrong lived, he would never do these things with me. He might not, she sobbed, even be all there. He might, as long as he lived, lie on the rubber sheet in the center of the bed in the front bedroom where the white Marquisette curtains billowed out in the afternoon sea breeze, rustling like palmetto fronds. It was bad enough having an invalid brother. I'm sorry. It was bad enough having an invalid brother, but having one who possibly was not all there was unbearable. So I began to make plan plans to kill him by smothering him with a pillow. However, one afternoon as I watched him, my head poked between the arm post of the foot of the bed, he looked straight at me and grinned. I skipped through the rooms down the echoing hall shouting, Mama, he smiled, he's all there, he's all there, and he was. When he was two, if you laid him on his stomach, he began to move himself, straining terribly. The, doc the doctor said that with his weak heart, the strain would probably kill him, but it didn't. Trembling, he pushed back himself up, turning first red, then a soft purple, and finally collapsed back onto the bed like an old worn out doll. I can still see Mama watching him, her hand pressed tight across her mouth, her eyes wide and unblinking, but he learned to crawl it was his third winter, and we brought him out of the front bedroom, putting him on the rug before the fireplace. For the first time, he became one of us. As long as he lay all the time in bed, we called him William Armstrong, even though it was formal and sounded as if we were referring to one of our ancestors. 
but with his creeping around on the deerskin rug and beginning to talk, something had to be done about his name. It was I who renamed him. When he crawled, he crawled backward, as if he were in reverse and couldn't change gears. If you called him, he'd turn around as if he were going in the other direction. Then he'd back right up to you to be picked up. Crawling backward made him look like a doodle bug. So I began to call him Doodle. And in time, even mom and daddy thought it was a better name than William Armstrong. Only Aunt Nicey disagreed. She said call babies should be treated with special respect since they might turn out to be saints. Renaming my brother was perhaps the kindest thing I ever did for him because nobody expects much from someone called Doodle. Although Doodle learned to crawl, he showed no signs of walking, but he was an idol. He talked so much that we all quit listening to what he said. It was about this time that Daddy built him a go-kart and I had to pull him around. At first, I just paraded him up and down the piazza, but then he started crying to be taken out into the yard, and it ended up by my having to lug him wherever I went. If I so much as picked up my cap, he'd start crying to go with me, and Mama would call from wherever she was, take Doodle with you. He was a burden in many ways. The doctor had said that he mustn't get too excited too hot, too cold, or too tired, and that he must always be treated gently. A long list of don'ts went with him, all of which I ignored once we got out of the house. To discourage his coming with me, I'd run with him across the ends of the cotton rows and careen him around corners on two wheels. Sometimes I accidentally turned him over, but he never told Mama. His skin was very sensitive, and he had to wear a big straw hat whenever he went out. When the going got rough and he had to cling to the sides of the go-kart, the hat slipped all the way down over his ears. He was a sight. Finally, I could see I was licked. Doodle was my brother, and he was going to cling to me forever, no matter what I did. So I dragged him across the burning cotton field to share with him the only beauty I knew, Old Woman Swamp. I pulled the go-kart through the sawtooth fern, down into the green, green dimness where the palmetto fronds whispered by the stream. I lifted him out and set him down in the soft rubber grass beside a tall pine. His eyes were round with wonder as he gazed about him, and his little hands began to stroke the rubber grass. Then he began to cry. For heaven's sake, what's the matter? I asked, annoyed. It's so pretty, he said. So pretty, pretty, pretty. After that, Doodle and I often went down into Old Woman Swamp. I would gather wildflowers, wild violets, honeysuckle, yellow jasmine, snake flowers, and water lilies and with wire grass, we'd weave them into necklaces and crowns. We'd bedeck ourselves with our handiwork and loll about thus beautified beyond the touch of the everyday world. Then when the slanted rays of the sun burned orange in the top of the pines, we'd drop our jewels into the stream and watch them float away toward the sea. There is within me, and with sadness I have watched it in others, a knot of cruelty borne by the stream of love. Much as our blood sometimes bears the seed of our destruction, and at times I was mean to doodle. One day I took him up to the barn loft and showed him his casket, telling him how we all had believed he would die. It was covered with a film of Paris green, sprinkled to kill the rats and screech owls had built a nest inside it. Doodle studied the mahogany box for a long time and then said, it's not mine. It is, I said, and before I'll help you down from the loft, you're going to have to touch it. I won't touch it, he said sullenly. 
Then I'll leave you here by yourself, I threatened, and made as if I were going down. Doodle was frightened of being left. Don't go leave me, brother, he cried, and he leaned toward the coffin. His hand trembling reached out, and when he touched the casket, he screamed. A screech owl flapped out of the box into our faces, scaring us and covering us with power scream. Doodle was paralyzed, so I put him on my shoulder and carried him down the ladder. And even when we were outside in the bright sunshine, he clung to me crying, don't leave me, don't leave me. When Doodle was five years old, I was embarrassed at having a brother of that age who couldn't walk. So I set out to teach him. We were down an old woman's swamp and it was spring and the sick sweet smell of bay flowers hung everywhere like a mournful song. I'm going to teach you to walk, Doodle, I said. He was sitting comfortably on the soft grass, leaning back against the pine. Why, he asked. I hadn't expected such an answer. So I won't have to haul you around all the time. I can't walk, brother, he said. Okay, so we'll end today's lesson here and we will continue the next time.